So our final presenter, hey, and um, I, you know, everybody look up and be happy, our final presenter. There's 118 people still in the chat room arguing over what Jesse was just talking about. I was just in the window looking at it. So they're pretty lively in the virtual world out there. And just to give you an idea, uh, you know, just yesterday alone, we had around 200 people consistently in the chat room communicating, and we had about 380 unique live streamers uh, watching. That's yesterday. So for the people that were in this room, we're going to triple the people that were engaged in this content uh, in the virtual world from what was in this room. So that's pretty exciting. Jeff, you can't ask me a question. <laughs> Um, where are the participants in the chat room from? Are they um, from well, all over the world? Ju just to give you an idea, we had 17 countries uh, viewing yesterday. Uh, the top three countries were Canada, UK, and <laughs> Germany. <laughs> Germany. Hey, but, hey, but the Chinese are tweeting us, and they've been watching this. So uh, th remember, everything here is unclassed. Everything's uh, live streamed. We're about broad engagement. So that's the big idea. But yes, 17 different countries. So our last presenter today, and, and, you, and you moved my information on Linda. There, there you go. <laughs> is Professor Linda Glenn. She's at the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies and at Cal State Monterey, close to Naval Postgraduate School uh, there in Monterey, which is the old Fort Ord for all you old soldiers, um, uh, that, that area. And Professor... Or, uh, Professor uh, Linda McDonald Glenn. We we came across her. She was uh, interviewed w in National Geographic, and uh, she said some very interesting things. And we and we got in touch with her, with her and just spent about an hour talking to her and knew we had to bring her here uh, to talk to you because I have a feeling she's going to tell you some things and talk to you about some things that you haven't heard. So we look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Lee, and thank you to everyone for inviting me. Uh, this is an honor and a pleasure. <clears throat> And uh, this is something that I am just so fascinated with, and I've enjoyed every moment of this, uh, this conference. <clears throat> Lee told you a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a, I've been a director in Humanity Plus, a fellow at the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technology. And I alluded earlier to having a difficult time the last few weeks because my sister, who is an expert in her own right in cybersecurity, passed away suddenly and unexpectedly on July 8th. And I came from California because she's, um, she lived here on the East Coast, and I haven't been back to California since. <clears throat> Uh, but what my sister would say is, uh, you go do this, girl. Uh, go kick some ass, because you know, we grew up in New Jersey, and you can take the girl out of Jersey, but you can't take the Jersey out of the girl. So um, I've dedicated this presentation to her. She and I uh, would often have <laughs> a lot of intellectual battles over what constituted, uh, over ethics, what should or should not be done. And uh, I am going to, uh, I'm going to miss her terribly, but um, I'm going to try and hope that the values and that she'll inspire me to carry on her work, the work that we did together. <clears throat> To, re to reiterate what some other people have said, uh, yes, it, it is hard to predict the future. And uh, as Yogi Berra said, um, half, I never really said half the things I said, but uh, some, somebody said that, I don't know, some pearls of wisdom from smart people there. So we've heard a lot about the convergence of all these technologies. And the first part of this is just basically a review of some of the things that we, I have heard, we have gone over, uh, and then I'll get a little bit more into the meat of it. But 
the big, one of the big questions is, as crea creators, because we are creators of new life forms, what are our moral and legal responsibilities? And as you heard me say earlier, what's legal is not always ethical, and what's ethical is not always legal. From micro to macro, um, some of the material, the uh, cognitive couture uh, that we've seen here, I, was, I thought that was a great phrase for the intersection of brain and uh, machine, the interfaces. <clears throat> and also the nanomaterials. Some of these things will certainly have applications in civilian uses too, including eyelashes that can control drones. Kin kinematics that uh, a 3D print, a 4D printing system that com uh, combines computational geometric techniques with rigid body physics and customization. Digital camouflage. Someone early, one of the speakers earlier had spoken about how you'll be able to ID someone through facial recognition, but the counter to that is there's going to be digital camouflage, so you can hide, because as soon as somebody creates something that will recognize, you can be sure there's somebody who's going to create something to counter it. <clears throat> you probably have all seen this picture. Um, I think this was actually in National Geographic, the exoskeleton that I was referring to that I really wish I had had yesterday. <laughs> <clears throat> and more exoskeleton technologies to create uh, uh, the super soldier. But in addition to the individual soldier and materiel, there's enhancement of the surrounding battlefield. And we talked about this a little bit yesterday in the lunch, uh, the working lunch, about enhancing the battlefield environment, how will, be, how will we be able to feed the troops, the combat troops, efficiently in a way that minimizes its ecological footprint? And nanotechnology uh, is allowing us to create targeted nutrition, time-released food, uh, <laughs> functional foods, and also cellular agriculture. I don't know how many of you heard that term. Do you know what I mean by cellular agriculture? What I'm talking about cellular agriculture is I'm talking about growing meat on scaffolding, growing a chicken breast without having to grow the entire chicken. <clears throat> and it is taking off. Uh, it's going on in Silicon Valley. So and you can imagine with 3D printers coming up, and uh, the, some of the technology, you can have actually a little, I don't know if you call it a chicken farm, but anyway, it would be ce cellular agriculture in the battlefield to be able to feed the troops. <clears throat> also, cheese and milk. This is remarkable. I don't, how many of you here have either know someone or uh, use uh, insulin? Some, know someone who uses insulin? Okay, do you know how insulin is produced? In the 1970s, through recombinant DNA, oh, in, in the 1970s, through recombinant DNA, um, scientists were able to take insulin and combine it with uh, bacteria so that you could mass produce it. We could not kill enough animals to produce the amount of insulin that we would need for today's population. So it is grown in vats with bacteria, and that's what's used by diabetics. And uh, I'm, wow. we're taking the same technology and using it for cheese and milk to be able to mass produce it, again, without having um, CAFOs, the corporate agri agricultural feeding operations. So to me, the enhancement goes far beyond the individual and the soldier. It goes to the entire environment. <clears throat> so, and a lot of these same things that I'm talking about enhancing the environment actually 
came out of regenerative medicine. <laughs> so yeah, you would use the same technique for growing a chicken breast, you'd use the same technique to grow a heart or a kidney or a liver. So uh, the medics of the battlefield in the future will be able to 3D print another organ instead of having to uh, <clears throat> get someone uh, to emergency care or fly them out of the country. Neuroprosthetics. So, <clears throat> I mean, to a large extent, we are cyborgs now. Okay. I don't know how many of you have, say, knee implants or contacts, but this is one of the things that I've been fascinated with, the human evolution of the cyborg, incorporating um, <clears throat> things that are not naturally within us with um, outside things. And the question, one of the big questions is, can you replace so much of yourself that you are no longer yourself? that you're no longer the same person. And I'll get into that shortly in a little bit. And as I'd mentioned, tissue engineering, <clears throat> too, is coming along much more quickly. I had to see an orthopedic surgeon about my knee. He wanted to get me, he wanted, he said to me, why don't you just go for a knee replacement? And I said, heck no. I, first of all, I plan to outlive that knee replacement. <laughs> and secondly, um, I think that probably in about 10 or 15 years that we will have the technology through stem cell technology, uh, regenerative medicine, to be able to regrow the cartilage in the knee. It's not that far away. <clears throat> Self-sustaining augmentation genetic engineering. We've been hearing a lot about CRISPR and the potential impact on, well, the population, soldiers, <clears throat> and human silicon interfaces, which uh, Dr. G had spoken about. Neuromorphic chips, which are bio-inspired and uh, using neurally based algorithms to process sensory data and to respond in changes. So what do we want for our future soldiers? What do we want for future humanity? Some of the things that we're seeing is uh, in enhanced beings is enhanced communication. Do we want to include empathy? Is empathy a virtue? And how much empathy? And it becomes questions of balancing rights and responsibilities. Should we be considering enhancing morality? And then the question is, whose morality or whose ethics do we use? And I remember the name of the poem <laughs> that I would referred to earlier. It's Machines of Loving Grace. <clears throat> One of the things that's also happening that I'm not sure I heard any of the speakers talk, talking about was mind uploading. I have a colleague in San Francisco by the name of Randall Cohen, Kona? Randall Kona, and some others who are looking at uh, replicating mind patterns and uploading them into the cloud or into a different substrate. Now, there is a, and I wish Dr. G was here to uh, talk or to talk a little bit more about this. Uh, there's the extended mind thesis, which is that your mind is not just between your ears, that your mind is extended. It is that it is part of more of an environment that you cannot simply have a brain in a box because without sensory input, it, it means nothing. Your brain cannot uh, function. Uh, your brain can function, but it wouldn't have the same sort of interactions. It, it, you wouldn't be behaving necessarily as a person. And then there's the whole issue of whole brain emulation. People are theorizing that uh, does it, do you have to be biological to be a person? 
Um, there's notions of destructive uploading, uh, gradual uploading, which actually I think would be ideal. That is replacing parts of yourself piece by piece. And, and you don't even know that that part's gone. So you have this sense of continuity of self. And then there's non-destructive uploading, which gets into fascinating philosophical questions. If you create a copy of yourself, is that really you? So, or is it now another entity with its own experiences? So what do we mean by augmentation? Are we creating superhumans, extended capabilities? And I thought this chart showed a very uh, nice, um, it was a nice illustration of the various dimensions of human augmentation. And of course, I will make this presentation available to anybody who requests it. And <clears throat> to touch upon the social issues of human augmentation, um, those are numerous. For one example, life extension. We have already extended life significantly. Now, a lot of it admittedly has simply been through correction of hygiene, learning things about germs. But <clears throat> to give you an example, oh my gosh, uh, most of you would be dead in this room by the time if we were living in Cro-Magnon ages. The average lifespan in 2002 was 78. It went up to 84. Now it's gone back down a little bit because of the obesity em epidemic and, and, and other problems. But on a general curve, we're seeing more and more life expectancy. And there have been billboards, at least in California, that say the first person who will live to 150 has been born. So, but should we live 200 years? What is that going to mean? And personally, I wouldn't mind another 50 years in good health. <laughs> on the other hand, if that was going to create a strain uh, on the family, on the environment, I'm not so sure. Maybe better to upload my brain, <laughs> take up less energy. So here are just some of the common social objections. Um, it will create a bi biological divide. And this is a problem we are facing right now with income inequality. Those who have the wealth can have the regenerative medicine. They can go to the clinics in Mexico or other places to have these experimental treatments. Oh, questionable as to whether some of them work, but apparently some of them do. Uh, <clears throat> another objection is Oh, well, it's too dangerous. You will never be able to do it safely. This has been referred to as the precautionary principle. But the problem with the precautionary principle is can you think of how many things we would not be doing if we had, had the, the precautionary principle basically says you can't use something until it's proven safe. So can you name one or two things at least that we would not be using if we had had to prove them safe first? Transfusion? Vaccines? How about cell phones? Automobiles? There would be no progress at all. So the precautionary principle is not a practical thing to live by. <clears throat> Some of the objections are that it violates the natural order of things, conflicts with natural uh, with religious teaching, uh, or that it might be an ecological and social disaster, which might be a fair point because the earth is straining under a growing population. <clears throat> and <clears throat> the dark side of the technology, I don't know how many of you have ever watched the series Black Mirror, but it's, a, it's on Netflix. And in one particular episode called Men Against Fire, uh, augmented reality is being used to demonize one's enemies, to make warfare easier for the soldiers because as humans, generally speaking, we don't like to kill other humans. Of course, there's that one to two percent of the population that are sociopaths, psychopaths, but as a general rule, it's hard to kill somebody. It's not something that we want to do. <clears throat> now, 
Here are, you know, are some of the deeper questions. What does it mean to be a person? What does it mean to be a human? It's actually two separate questions. There is not a legal definition for what it means to be human. Think about that. You can say, all right, what about homo sapiens? All right, well, Linnaeus created this categorization. We like to put things into boxes and categorize things. But what about Homo floriensis, which was recently discovered in the, not too long ago discovered uh, in the uh, um, forests of Indonesia. All right, and there have been other Homo type discoveries for um, that are very, very close. If you try and use a genetic definition, what does that mean in terms of CRISPR? And if we create new soldiers with different DNA, does that automatically put them into the category of non-human? So what it means to be a person and to be given moral and legal status is something that has been in flux and changed. At the, at the very corner there, you see something that has been referred to as the great chain of being. And this is a very uh, old, uh, basic Judeo-Christian. You have God at the top, and the angels, and the seraphims, and the cherubims. And then you have man. Notice I say man and not man and woman. All right, and then you have the animals, plants, and the earth. This is the natural order of things. And how many times have you heard someone say, oh, it's just an animal. It's just a lower life form. This is built into our legal thinking. And this was based upon, this was pre-Copernicus and Galileo. It was when we thought we were at the center of the universe. But yet that model has not changed. There are advantages to that model. I, will, I won't dispute that. You can't see very well, but there's more of a circular approach, a holistic approach, which is uh, more level. But then what about this notion of human dignity or even stewardship? It doesn't work so well with this flat model. <clears throat> we need to be thinking about other models, like maybe an alternative pyramid of interdependence where we recognize that things are built upon one another and there's interrelationships rather than something that exists uh, separately. <clears throat> so the thing about the law, and you heard me say earlier, is that traditionally there's a dichotomy. Either a person or property. If you're property, you have no rights, too bad, so sad. If you're a person, well, then you have something called negative liberties and positive liberties. Negative liberties can be thought of as freedoms from. Okay, so you have the freedom, the right to be free from bodily invasion. You have the right to be free from imprisonment without due process. There are minimal negative liberties. Positive liberties include things such as the right to own property. <clears throat> and traditionally, non-human animals have been considered uh, property, but as we've learned from history, women's uh, slaves' children were regarded as property until the uh, mid to late 1800s and early 1900s, yet non-human entities, such as corporations and ships, have been recognized and given rights as persons. In the 1800s, the United States Supreme Court recognized um, <clears throat> that corporations, without any real depth or explanation, well, of course corporations are persons. So all humans are persons but not all persons are human. <laughs> so <clears throat> even ships have been granted status as persons by the um, United States Supreme Court. The United States Supreme Court, though, does have a spectrum 
uh, natural persons, which would include aliens, minors, illegitimate, juridical persons. These are legal fictions that have been created for convenience. So you have corporations, labor unions, municipalities, and ships. But there is very little uh, way in uh, there's very little in the way of legislation or statutory, statutory definition of what it means to be a person. It is all based on case law. It's casuistic. And as I said, the difficulty with trying to define human is that it seems to be a moving target. We can't define it genetically if we're going to be using CRISPR. A slight variation in genetics could result in an entirely different creature. So this is a bit of a problem, but it is an invitation to expand our moral universe. So what beings should be considered persons? Um, you probably have heard of about the uh, right to life mo movement. The, uh, there's been referendum to include fetuses and embryos. Uh, there was a em personhood for embryos referendum in Colorado, which failed. In Louisiana, in Louisiana um, there is actually a law that says that a fertilized egg and uh, sperm constitutes a legal person, except for the purposes of in vitro fertilization. Okay, <laughs> a little, it, it presents a little bit of difficulty. <clears throat> um, animals, there has been a tremendous movement to recognize that animals, particularly our pets, are not mere property. They're not persons either, but maybe they occupy a category in between. How many of you have pets? And how many of you consider them members of your family? <laughs> and how many of you, I, I, I doubt very few of them would compare them to the same thing as this table or a non-feeling being because they have feelings, they have sentience, they have the ability to feel pleasure and pain. So artificial intelligence, um, categories in between, individuals with numeral, numeral Im, um, sorry, <laughs> numerous implants and augmentations or uploaded minds. <clears throat> so as I get back to the dichotomy, and as Dr. G said earlier, and some of the other speakers said, with great power comes great responsibility, which brings us to the question of uh, legal rights and responsibilities. If you are augmented, do you have greater responsibilities? Perhaps you should. And the question is, as I mentioned earlier, can you replace so much of yourself that you are no longer yourself? Well, interestingly, there may be precedents on this. The jack-o'-lantern case, 1922. Ships are persons under United States Supreme Court. There was uh, a case where a vessel, the question was whether or not the vessel continued in its identity or it ha was it continued or had it been um, extinguished. This vessel had been stripped, stripped pretty much from stem to stern, but it still had the uh, backbone. I'm sorry, I can't think of the word, not the backbone, the um, keel. keel. Thank you, it still had the keel. Um, and it had been changed from a cargo vessel to a party dancing boat. Okay. And the court said, we're not going to look at the use or the purpose. Uh, we're not going to lock it into a rigid definition uh, in repairs and construction. We do not accept the suggestion that two things can be accurately differentiated by the ultimate use to which the vessel was to, uh, to be devoted. So it held, despite extensive repairs, the ship identity remained the same. Uh, by analogy, by analogy, you could argue that perhaps 
as long as you still have your nervous system, your brain and your nervous system, you may be able to replace all of yourself and still uh, retain the same identity. It's at least a theoretical possible argument with possible precedents. <clears throat> State of the law is a little bit in flux. This case in 19, I'm sorry, this was in 2001, was a tariff dispute where the US Customs identified action figures as dolls uh, represented only human beings. Uh, but Toy Biz, because of tariffs, argued that the X-Men dolls were non-humans. Uh, the court held that the action figures did not represent human beings because they had robotic future or monster-like features. But interestingly, after this decision was issued, customs laws have changed so that there is no distinction. So it's become a moot point. So we don't have to worry about that, <laughs> that uh, precedence anymore. We've heard a lot about AI guidelines. The, there's 23 principles, which I've not put up here. Um, for the sake of brevity, and so that you wouldn't all fall asleep. Uh, but these 23 principles that were um, developed in February earlier this year were intended to guide the safe development of artificial intel intelligence, were not limited to safety, safety, privacy, liberty, as well as its shared benefits, but there are several things that are missing that are not addressed that should be of concern to this community and actually much of the community. There is a lack of transparency of purpose. There is a call for transparency after something has gone wrong, all right, if there's been some injury, but call there, there should be a call for transpar transparency of purpose before the AI is used, but that was next because it might, because it would in, uh, weaken intellectual uh, properties and undermine uh, economic advantages between competitors. <clears throat> Furthermore, these 23 principles, the way they are written, ensure that AI retains the status of property at all times, even if it is integrated with an individual, which, again, presents something of a problem. What about the enhanced soldier uh, with integrated AI? <clears throat> Some of the projects that are currently going on, in, including Dr. G's um, project, uh, brain scales, the Europe, Europe's human brain, uh, DARPA, Elon Musk's Neuralink, in which he is seeking to integrate AI with the human brain. But Elon Musk was also one of the principals in the development of these 23 guiding principles uh, for the Asilomar uh, guidelines for AI. Just a little bit of a conflict of interest. <clears throat> so, some recommendations. Uh, where can we go with this? There are things we can do because as we uh, know, the best way to predict the future is to help create it. And uh, partly in response to the dark preview that we've seen earlier, Google X's motto, and I have uh, a nephew who works at Google X, it's easier to, to beg for forgiveness than it is to ask for permission. <clears throat> in terms of the rapid prototyping and time cycle. Also, good artists uh, borrow, borrow, but great artists steal. You hear great ideas. Don't hesitate to take them. I'm not saying break the law. I could never say that. And try not to let institutional arthritis, or as one of my colleagues here said, constitution, uh, institutional constipation slow you down. And it's all, this is, this, no, oh, pardon the pun, these movements, okay, have all been uh, reflected uh, in this conference. I can't believe I said that, yeah. <laughs> the Millennium Project. I think many of you here are already familiar with the Millennium Pro Pro Project, and I would urge you uh, to collaborate, to 
bring these think, think, think tanks together because the Millennium Project has identified the 15 global challenges. Uh, and what are wars about? Often about property, about scarce resources, about, uh, and the Millennium Project report, the most recent one, has identified the 15 most likely global challenges to trigger war, including income inequality. And <clears throat> uh, I think there are many parts of uh, the Army that are already uh, doing this, but if they hadn't, I thought it would be uh, a good thing to incorporate. The 15 global challenges also focus on resiliency, a word I've heard here used often over and over again. <clears throat> Population and resources, science and technology, education, the status of women. <sighs> One more proposal. Um, and we may be doing this at the military level now, but I'd like to see this start a lot sooner, perhaps in undergraduate um, classes. The development of the interdisciplinary studies of, I should, I forgot to include bio-inspired in here, interspecies and bio-inspired communications, including but not limited to electromagnetic field, biochemical signals, the neuroscience of linguistics, thinking in images versus words, the connectome, physical touch, telepathy, echolocation, cybernetic dolphins, which are already being used by the Navy, <laughs> um, and more. Because the future of warfare is going to look very different. These are tools at our disposal that will not only help us communicate better, but also help us understand the larger connectedness, the interconnectedness of the systems. We've heard a lot about the enhanced soldiers, um, human soldiers, but we haven't talked about uplifted animals. David Brin, a colleague of mine, a friend, writer, writes about, has an entire series, The Uplift Universe, about uplifted animals and their potential role in uh, warfare and which gets into those expanding notions of personhood, too. <clears throat> so another recommendation is that we need to revisit this, ditch the dichotomy, dichotomy and consider either a continuum, a casuistic approach, or perhaps the pyramid. Um, where do rights and laws come from? They come from courts, legislatures, UN declarations, proclamations. There is a dark side to the continuum. Um, I want to make that very clear. The dark side is that you consider something less than human. It can be used a little too easily to enslave it. Um, the pyramidal um, model, I think, perhaps has a little bit more flexibility because it recognizes that things are built upon one another and that moral status it is cum cumulative as well as rights and responsibilities. <clears throat> and the recognition that personhood is not a static idea. It hasn't been and it won't be. It will continue like the extended mind to grow and to develop. Just like we talked about the hierarchical uh, the, the hierarchy of, of command and uh, networks, they don't always work. We need to explore different types of networks. And persons are part of a complex moving system. We do not, humans do not exist in a vacuum. We are part of the biosphere. And it's from a complex systems uh, theory approach you can't just look at one piece without looking at the others because there are cascading impacts. <clears throat> so for the future, we need to get ready for cyborgization <laughs> and practicing resi re resiliency. 
the boundaries of what is person and property will continue to blur and blend. And one of the questions we do want to ask, as Jesse Kirkpatrick had said earlier, is uh, what virtues, what sort of beings do we want to be? Do we want to, to be the sort of individuals who follow the golden rule? Or as I heard someone say, no, he who has the gold rules. And um, we will continue to incorporate more and more computer technologies and machines into ourselves until we become one with it. And this is something that Ray Kurzweil has also um, spoken about. And to a large extent, it's happening already. I you know, think about the carrying around of my PDA, my computer. I think of it as, uh, to, uh, I think of it as an extension of my brain. There was one other thing. Hmm. So, in closing, I want to say that the laws are powerful tools. The law can be used as a weapon, or it can be used as um, a uniting tool, and it can actually shape behavior by creating social norms that people use to measure morality and the worth of their actions. Le legal rituals can make and unmake persons. And the law can be used as a weapon for creating divisions, marginalizing those who are different and depriving individuals of personhood. And if the law is used in such a destructive manner, persons who are judged outside the law's um, protection will often resort to an alternative understanding of the law, resulting in unrest and civil unrest and, uh, and, and uh, conflict. There is an emerging area of law called therapeutic jurisprudence, which is, which is the thought that the law can be used to heal conflict. What a novel idea, <laughs> um, and hopeful. Therapeutic jurisprudence focuses on the study of uh, the law as a the ther therapeutic agent. <clears throat> I, I have more written about this. I'll, I have an article coming out shortly about this, and I'll be happy to uh, pass it on as soon as it is uh, published. To follow up, to finish though, I would like to refer to something my sister Dr. Jean Ann Boyce referred to as Boyce's law of temporal displacement, that is, as computers become faster, we become more and more patient, uh, impatient with them until they catch up with our brain. <laughs> I've had anybody yet dispute that. <laughs> so I want to thank you again for your attention, and please feel free to contact me. Uh, here's my email, and thank you again for having me uh, speak here today. It's been an honor and pleasure. Are we going to take a couple of questions for Linda? Uh, so yes. I have sort of an opposite question. So technology and integration with the human, I see all that. There's certain benefits to it and value. But there's uh, Probably going to be a point where uh, people just want to disconnect. Absolutely. And so, uh, there, uh, what do you see is is that a paradigm, and when do you see that that occurring? It, it happens now in certain instances, right? People just completely disconnect from, not society, but from the board, so to speak. Right. And so, how do you how do you meld those two different paradigms? <clears throat> well, I think what will happen is there right now how. Occasionally you have people, we have experiments where we have students put away their phones for a day or two, and then we have them write down their experience. How do you think they respond? <laughs> they really don't like it. Uh, I do, but it's a very good question and a valid concern because I do worry that our brain waves are changing so that we're becoming so reliant upon the technology that we will not be able to function without it. And I think it was as uh, 
Tom said earlier, in the, 19, in, you know, in the 2050s, now we have soldiers who have learned how to drive a car. But in the 2050s, with driverless cars, oh my gosh, are we going to have to retrain people how to do that? I think that as part of this entire evolution, it is important to remember, or important to emphasize, not to become overly dependent on this technology. There are certain things I think every human should know how to do, how to put together things, how to drive a vehicle, maybe how to you know, sew a shirt or at least uh, sew something together. And perhaps we need to enforce these periods of, I'm not sure what the quite word be, I don't want to say isolation, uh, but these periods of non-reliance on technology. Uh, I can't think of a proper word. The closest thing that comes to mind is like sabbat, a Sabbath, but that's in a religious context. Um, maybe we need to think of new terminology, sort of taking a break from the technology. Uh, it's a concern. Um, <laughs> you had mentioned um, the biological divide uh, that will be um, uh, creating and evolving. Um, I'm curious what your thoughts are on uh, how incentive structure, excuse me, incentive structures could be created to counteract that uh, and not allow a power law distribution to take over and just almost create a spinoff of a new species. Let's I think that is. Um, I think that that is a, a very good question. And it gets in, a bit into the socioeconomic political aspects, which I have to say, I think that the, um, uh, the report, the uh, State of the Future report addresses. There are potential, um, uh, potential w uh, ways of addressing this issue, such as a universal basic income, also, uh, perhaps making a uh, making artificial intelligence something that is not um, so subject to protected intellectual property, uh, but definitely somehow making this technology more and more accessible. Now, I've had people say to me, "Oh, well, you know, it'll just be like the cell phone." You know, because in the 1990s, cell phones were ridiculous amounts of money, and now everybody has a cell phone. But in fact, having that technology, if you look at the economics of it, has increased the economic divide, the inequality gap, because the first adopters who have the advantage have continued, you know, have, it's continued this split. So. We really need to have some serious socio-political economic discussions about in income inequality and uh, distribution, redistribution of resources. Because as Benjamin Franklin said, uh, either we all hang together or we will all surely hang uh, separately. <laughs> I think that's a paraphrase. Yeah, we will all hang apart. Or, I'm sorry? You nailed it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Does that answer your question? I think that was the last question. All right, thank you. And I'm wearing Thomas Jefferson.